Welcome once again, folks, to the Hour of the Time. I'm your host, William Cooper. We'll start off tonight's show with the Socialist National Anthem. (laughs) Oh, I love it. The Socialist National Anthem, born under a bad sign. Folks, tonight's episode of Mystery Babylon, the 18th hour, I'm going to take directly, verbatim, from Chapter 9 of A. Ralph Epperson's book called The New World Order. He's going to be a guest on this show soon, and you'll know why once you hear what, uh, what we've got to say tonight, so pay attention. And remember, as always, as always, just because I'm giving you this series on Mystery Babylon doesn't mean that you're supposed to believe what I'm telling you blindly. That's why I gave you the bibliography last night. You've got to go out and find the truth from your own research. And I'm the only one that ever tells you that. Everybody else wants you to believe verbatim what they say because they're saying it and they're who they are. And I'm telling you not to believe anybody, not even me, not even your own mother, unless you can verify it in your own work, your own research. Make sure that you do it, too. Before we start, folks, remember, remember, all of you have been asking me what to do with your assets, how to save your assets, how to survive this depression that we're in now. And make no mistake, we're in a depression, and it's going to get worse. In fact, we're headed for a total economic collapse that I predicted years ago. And I, I called the shots on this recession that went into a depression to the exact month, to the exact month when it would begin, and it began right on schedule exactly when I said it would. And I was the only one that told you the banks would not fail on December the 19th. And I told you that on a show I aired on December the 6th. (laughs) Folks, I hate being right. I'm telling you, this is the truth, I hate being right. I'm probably the only one in the world who doesn't like being right because it does not portend well for us. Now, if you want to know what to do with your assets, you call Swiss America Trading Corporation and do it right now. You know me. I do not advertise anybody that I don't wholeheartedly believe in, would not recommend to you with no reservations. And I never, ever allow anybody to sponsor this show unless I myself personally use their product. So call Swiss America Trading Corporation. We've checked them out top, bottom, backwards, forwards. Every way that there's possible to check somebody out, we've done it. It's a good company. They're good people. They believe like I do. They believe like you do, the listeners to this show. They've been in business for over 11 years. They deliver non-confiscatable, non-reportable hard assets directly to your door. They have a newsletter, a good newsletter that openly and unequivocally, without pulling any punches, they deal with the imminent economic collapse that's coming. They will treat you and your business with the utmost privacy and discretion, which is an integral part of their relationship with all of their clients, not just you, but everyone who does business with them. This is Swiss America Trading Corporation, folks. Call them right now, 1-800-289-2646. There's no obligation. You're going to get something for free, and you don't have to give anything to them if you don't want to. So call 1-800-289-2646. 2646. Once more, 1 800 289 2646. Tell them that you listened to the hour of the time and that William Cooper sent you. And they'll send you their complimentary newsletter entitled, quote, Protecting Your Future, unquote. Ask for it. Make sure that you get it. The only obligation that you have is to commit an hour to reading this report, this newsletter. 
and considering the information that you find in it, and I guarantee you that you will enjoy reading it. It will open your eyes to some things that you may not have considered before. And then you can make a decision on what you're going to do with your assets. Now, you know what I've recommended, and if you don't know, call Stan and get the tapes concerning the Federal Reserve and the economic collapse that I've done because I'm not going to keep saying the same things over and over and over again. I may rerun those at some future date when I need a break, but I'm not going to continually repeat these things. So most of you know what I've recommended. And I've also told you that I'm not a financial advisor. I recommend those things through my own research and through the research into history as to what's been valuable in deep depressions that we're going to be going into. But you make up your own mind, and you invest the way that you want to, not the way that I recommend if you don't agree with me. Understand? That's what this show is all about, folks. It's about getting you to think on your own, getting you to challenge what you've been taught and what you've been told, but in all cases, doing your own researches, making up your own mind, and coming up with your own gut truth. That's important. Now, if the truth is really the truth... In this process, most of us should come up with the same answers. That's why I'm so adamant about this. Swiss American Trading Corporation, folks, 1-800-289-2646. 1-800-289-2646. No obligation on your part. They're going to send you a free newsletter. Read it. You'll like it. You don't have to do anything with them if you don't want to. But I recommend that you do. Now, the Bible folks, discusses a being called Lucifer in both the Old and New Testaments, and we're going to be talking a lot about the Bible tonight because we have to look at this from every point of view. We've looked at it from the mystery schools. We've looked at it logically. We've looked at it historically. Now we're going to look at it from the Bible's point of view, but not strictly from the Bible's point of view. But you need to know this. The Bible discusses a being called Lucifer in both the Old and the New Testaments. Other names for this creature are Satan, and the devil. One of the first explanations of just who this being known as Lucifer is is found in the Old Testament in a book written by the prophet Isaiah who wrote around 740 BC. He wrote that Lucifer was created full of wisdom and was perfect. He was created the anointed cherub that covereth the throne of God and that he actually was upon the holy mountain of God. He later corrupted his wisdom by reason of his brightness. The Bible then records that God cast him to the ground. Isaiah wrote this in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. Quote, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Unquote. And folks, this was the very first, very first recorded UFO sighting if indeed it was a sighting at all. Notice that the fall of Lucifer weakened the nations of the world, and this will be examined in other chapters of this study. Quote, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit also upon the mound of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. Unquote. Luke a writer in the New Testament records in Luke chapter 10, verse 18, that Jesus said that he beheld, quote, Satan as lightning fall from heaven, unquote. Peter records in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, that God has, quote, spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down, unquote, as well. Paul, another New Testament writer, wrote this about Lucifer in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14, in about 57 A.D. Quote, and no marvel, for Satan is transformed into an angel of light, unquote. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, Paul wrote that Satan was capable of working, quote, lying wonders, unquote. In around 90 A.D., John, the author of the book known as Revelation, wrote in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, that Satan was a, quote, dragon, unquote. 
Lucifer shows up in the original site of human habitation on earth called the Garden of Eden. The creator, God, placed Adam, the first man, and later Eve, the first woman, in this garden, but told them that there were certain rules that they had to abide by. And these are spelled out in Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. Quote, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Unquote. Later, Lucifer spoke through his serpent to Eve, but in reality to both men and women. Quote, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil." Unquote. So from the above information, it is possible to glean a little knowledge about the nature of of Lucifer. One, he was cast down from heaven because he desired to ascend directly into the seat of heavenly power, the throne of God. Two, he is referred to as the son of the morning. This appears to be a reference to Lucifer being similar to the sun, which also rises every morning. His desire, number three, his desire is to sit on the north side of the mountain of God. Lucifer can deceive the world. This is number four. Lucifer can deceive the world because he has been transformed into an angel of light. And five, Lucifer can work lying wonders. Now, with those basic understandings, folks, of Lucifer in place, it will be possible to examine the views of others about this fallen entity. However, not all agree with the picture of Lucifer being evil. For Albert Pike wrote this, quote, There is no rebellious demon of evil, our principle of darkness, and in eternal controversy with God. Unquote. In fact, Mr. Pike believes that Lucifer was not a force of evil, but could be a force for good, and he wrote this in Morals and Dogma, which I forgot to give you yesterday in the bibliography. That's another one. Write it down, folks. Morals and Dogma by Albert Pike. Morals and Dogma by Albert Pike. He wrote this in Morals and Dogma, quote, For the initiates, those initiate, initiated into the true secrets of masonry, this is not a person but a force created for good, but which may serve for evil, unquote. To further amplify that belief of Mr. Pike's, it becomes important to quote a letter that he wrote on July the 14th, 1889, to the 23 Supreme Councils of the World, Judging from the contents of this letter, it appears that Mr. Pike was attempting to tell the leaders of the various supreme councils all over the world that they were to know that Lucifer was the secret god of the Masons. This letter clearly indicates that he believed the position that Lucifer was a god who had come to earth for the good of mankind, and he wrote this, quote, That which we must say to the crowd is... Presumably, Mr. Pike meant that the crowd was all of the non-Masons of the public at large. That which we, we must say to the crowd is we worship a God, but it is the God that one adores without superstition, unquote. So it appears that one of the purposes of this letter was to advise all of the top-ranking Masons that they were to concoct a story that the Masons worshipped the traditional God so that none could ever accuse them of worshipping a cherub, a nun-God, by the name of Lucifer. In other words, they were to deny that Lucifer was their god whenever an outsider was smart enough to break through all of the secrets and figure it out. Well, of course, folks, they're sworn to secrecy. They have to deny anything about the true secrets of their order. I mean, what kind of logic is this? That's plain as the nose in your face. You must understand that when you ask a Mason a question about Freemasonry, he's going to tell you a lie because he is sworn to secrecy, and he is sworn by blood oaths. And I know that by the time they've reached the 32nd degree, they've taken at least 32 different oaths swearing them to secrecy. Minimum. So, you should know this already. Now, let's continue, but I'm going to go back and read that part over. 
It appears that one of the purposes of this letter was to advise all of the top-ranking Masons that they were to concoct a story that the Masons worshipped the traditional god so that none could ever accuse them of worshipping a cherub, a nun god, by the name of Lucifer. It's very important. In other words, they were to deny that Lucifer was their god whenever an outsider was smart enough to break through all of the secrets and figure it out as I and many others have done, as a Ralph Epperson has done. So the secret inside the Masonic order is that Lucifer is their secret god. Any non-Mason today who attempts to explain to any of their Masonic friends or relatives that this is the secret inside the lodge will be met with an instantaneous denial. Every Mason, whether they know the secret of the lodge or not, will obviously deny the accusation because they must. Mr. Pike continued, quote, You may repeat it to the 32nd, 31st, and 30th degrees. The Masonic religion should be by all of us initiates of the high degrees maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine, unquote. You see, Albert Pike at that time was at the head of all the lodges of Freemasonry of the world and at the head of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry in the United States of America. Here Mr. Pike seems to indicate that is, it is the 30th, 31st, and 32nd degrees that are to be taught the Luciferian doctrine, the direct evidence that the honorary 33rd degree is formally taught that Lucifer is the great architect of the universe will be presented later. But here Pike seems to say that that lesson is to be taught at an earlier degree. Quote, if Lucifer were not God, would Adonai, the God of the Christians and the Jews, and his priest, calumniate, which is defined as spreading false and harmful statements about or to slander, would they calumniate him? Pike makes two incredible statements about Lucifer. One, he is considered to be a god, and two, the priests and the rabbis have it all backwards and are all slandering his name. As has been illustrated, the Bible states that Lucifer is nothing more than a fallen cherub. He's not a god. Yet Mr. Pike clearly states that Lucifer is a god. Now how can that be? And secondly, those who claim that he is the wicked one are slandering him. Those individuals have it all wrong. And Mr. Pike continued, quote, The true and pure philosophic religion is the belief in Lucifer, the equal of Adonai. Unquote. Adonai also spelled... Well, in the first place here, it's spelled A-D-O-N-A-Y, and he says Adonai, also spelled A-D-O-N-A-I, is the Hebrew word for God. To show that Pike was referring to the God of the Bible, he wrote this in his book entitled Morals and Dogma, quote, Adonai, the rival of Baal and Osiris, unquote. In other words, Adonai is Typhon. That's an aside from me, folks. That's not written in this book. But as you've been listening to this series that I've given you, you know that Adonai, if this is true, if he is the rival of Baal and Osiris, then he is Typhon. As has been illustrated, Osiris is the sun god, and the sun has been shown to be a symbol of Lucifer. Adonai is the rival of Lucifer, both in the Bible and in the writings of Albert Pike. Quote, but Lucifer, God of light and God of good, is struggling for humanity against Adonai, the god of darkness and evil, unquote. And here, once again, Mr. Pike writes that Lucifer and Adonai are rivals and that the religious world has it all backwards. Lucifer is the good God, and Adonai is the God of evil and darkness. The author would like to interrupt the narrative to make an observation, and this observation is being made by a Ralph Epperson, not me. He wrote this book. That authenticity of that letter by Albert Pike that was just quoted has been questioned by a variety of writers. It has been reported that Mr. Pike made these comments in an encyclical hand carried to the meeting of 23 Supreme Councils of the World on July 14, 1889 in Paris, France. This author, meaning A. Ralph Epperson, is willing to concede that the only evidence for the contents of this encyclical consists of it being quoted in a book written by a Frenchman named A. C. de la Rive, entitled La Femme et la infant dans la ranc mecon, meconnerie universelle. I'm not a French speaker, folks, so that's the best I can do. My tongue doesn't do those things, or at least I haven't practiced to make my tongue do those things. 
That title translated from French to English means The Woman and Child in Universal French Masonry. A copy of that page that contains that quote and the cover of the book has been supplied to this author, meaning A. Ralph Epperson, by a concerned researcher who had someone locate the book in France for him and make copies of the pertinent pages. The author has read another book that contains the English translation of that encyclical. That book is entitled Occult Theocracy and was written in 1933 by Edith Starr Miller. She cites the book by Mr. de la Rive as her source. She obviously believed that the letter was true and contained the actual thoughts of Mr. Albert Pike. He said it in so many other places, including in his own book, Morals and Dogma, that I also believe that the letter is true, and now I'm speaking as myself, William Cooper. In other words, going back to A. Ralph Epperson's words, in other words, the only source for the letter is a Frenchman who quotes it in his book and not Mr. Albert Pike himself. It must be assumed that Mr. Pike, if he were alive today and was asked whether the letter was his, would deny that he ever wrote such an encyclical, whether or not he had written it, because he must. He is sworn to maintain the secrets. But the reader is admonished to remember that if he did indeed worship Lucifer and wrote the encyclical, he would certainly have to deny it, so that answer would tell the researcher nothing. It is the contention of this writer, A. Ralph Epperson, and others who are attempting to decipher the secret symbols of the Masonic order that a small percentage of the Masons know that all of the symbols inside the lodge refer to Lucifer. And I am one of those who believe this, folks. My research has shown it to be absolutely true, and I can prove it. And I've already... I've already uh, given you direct quotes from many Freemasons that already prove it. And it must be remembered that these Masons must, of necessity, do all that they can to deny any, any revelation of any of the secrets of the Lodge. And certainly anyone today who believes that the contents of the letter are a fraud would do all that they could to discredit anyone who said that the thoughts were the actual thoughts of Pike. However, this writer, meaning A. Ralph Epperson, is of the opinion that Mr. Pike did indeed worship Lucifer and is not basing that conclusion on just this one letter. Notice that Mr. Pike has written elsewhere that he considered Lucifer to be the secret god of the Masonic Lodge, and I, William Cooper, have also found that to be true, not only in one or two, but in many instances. So it is not essential to this writer's, A. Ralph Epperson's, position that this encyclical be proven to be valid. It is the author's contention that there is ample evidence from other sources, including from Masons other than Mr. Pike, that the secret God inside the Masonic Lodges is Lucifer, and I wholeheartedly occur with Mr. Epperson. That evidence is available to anyone who cares to locate it. But there is another Mason who knows that Lucifer is the good God of a particular segment of the Masons, Pike's fellow 33rd degree Mason, Manley P. Hall, also felt that this God was a God of good. He wrote in his book entitled The Secret Teachings of All Ages, quote, Sun worship played an important part in nearly all the early pagan mysteries. The solar deity was slain by wicked ruffians who personified the evil principle of the universe. By means of certain rituals and ceremonies, symbolic of purification and regeneration this wonderful god of good was brought back to life and became the savior of his people unquote. this god who came back to life is not the jesus of the bible because mr hall refers to him as the solar deity he is referring to the death and resurrection of osiris covered in detail in the masonic rituals and i've already i've already relayed to you who osiris really is in fact, in this series on the mystery religion, I've proven it time and time and time again. But Manly P. Hall has further identified Lucifer as the god of some of his fellow Masons. He has written this in his book entitled The Lost Keys of Freemasonry. It's one of the books that I gave you last night, folks. When the Mason, quote, when the Mason learns the key to the warrior on the block is the proper application of the dynamo of the living power, he has learned the mystery of his craft. The seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands, and before he may step onward and upward, he must prove his ability to properly apply energy, unquote. Mikhail 
Bakunin, the Russian anarchist, also addressed this question of evil and good gods, and he wrote, quote, The evil one is the satanic revolt against divine authority, revolt in which we see the fecund, defined as being fertile, germ of all human emancipations, the revolution. Socialists recognize each other by the words, In the name of the one to whom the great wrong has been done, Satan, folks, is the eternal rebel, the first free thinker, and the emancipator of worlds. He makes men ashamed of his bestial ignorance and obedience. He emancipates him, stamps upon his brow the seal of liberty and humanity, and urging him to disobey and eat of the fruit of knowledge, unquote. You see, I've been telling you all along that socialists and the mystery religion of Babylon are the same, the same, the same. And now, in his book, A. Ralph Epperson has proven it. That thought that Lucifer was a good spirit to whom a great wrong was done is the basic thought that holds the New Age together according to Tex Mars, the author of two major books on the subject. And he has written, quote, Many New Agers commend Lucifer because by tempting Eve he enabled man to evolve toward enlightened knowledge and godhood, unquote. Remember I told you that with the gift of intellect man will develop technology that will make him God? They are working feverishly in laboratories now to uncover the secret of immortal life. Mr. Mars discusses the thoughts of a leader in a mystical organization called the Stell Group. How many times have I mentioned that? The Stell Group, named Eklal Koshana. He writes that this New Age leader says that, quote, Lucifer is the head of a secret brotherhood of spirits. The brotherhood is named after Lucifer because the great angel Lucifer has been responsible for the abolishment of Eden in order that men could begin on the road to spiritual advancement, unquote. Lars Hansen was reared in the Stell group. Lars Hansen was reared in the Stell group. Tom Valentine was a member of the Stell Group. Tom Valentine wrote a book called The Life and Death of Planet Earth. Get it and read it, folks. Tom Valentine was associated with the Communist Party. Now he's a member of the Liberty Lobby, which came right out of the old German Nazi Bund. They used to sing the Horst Wessel song at the beginning of their meetings. Wake up! Wake up! Wake up. Why do you think every time somebody calls Tom Valentine and asks him by free, about Freemasonry and their complicity in the conspiracy, he covers it up and hangs up on the person as quickly as possible and denies that there's any complicity of Freemasonry? Now, this makes me a little hot under the collar. I've got to cool down a little bit, so we're going to take a break, folks. Don't go away. I'll be right back after this very short pause. Well, folks, I needed that little break. I'll tell you right now, Tom Valentine has been attacking me for years because he knows that I know who he is and what he's about, that I know the origins of the Liberty Lobby, that I know their message is that our government is no good, it doesn't work, that it's turned against us, and it's all lies. For it's the people who are in these secret societies who have turned against us, who are delivering that message to us to get us to voluntarily overthrow or get rid of our own government, the only government in the history of the world that has ever set man free. And I'm the only one who let you know this. It's not our government. It's not the Constitution. It's not the Bill of Rights. It's not the structure. It's the secret societies. It's the Tom Valentines. It's the Bogreitzes. It's all of these people who belong to Freemasonry in the ancient order of the Rose and Cross, and the Knights Templar, and the sovereign and military order of the Knights of Malta, and the order of St. John of Jerusalem, and many more, many more. Socialist, international socialism, under many, many different names. You see, folks, you see, <laughs> the senator was right. Senator McCarthy was absolutely right. He was correct. He just didn't know the proper name. He thought he was ferreting out communism. He wasn't. You see, if he understood what I understand, then he would have survived the attacks 
of the very people that he was trying to ferret out who owned the media that turned against him and destroyed him. Hollywood, who turned against him and destroyed him through manipulating the opinion of the public. See, communism, folks, is just a word. It's another boogaboo enemy. <laughs> the real enemy, folks, is mystery Babylon. I could never say what I said tonight before, because if I had, it would have been misinterpreted. I had to have independent verification that the Stell group worshipped Lucifer before I could reply legitimately to the tax upon me by Tom Valentine. Because if I had told you what I know without independent verification, all of you would have turned against me as being a poor sport or some other bullshit. It's a real load off my chest to be able to deliver that message to you. I can tell you that right now. Real load off my chest. Let me continue. Remember, this is chapter 9 of A. Ralph Epperson's book, The New World Order. So there is a basic disagreement about the nature of Lucifer, also known as Satan or the devil. The Bible depicts him as a force for evil, and Mr. Pike and others pictures him as a force for good. But the connection between Lucifer and the ancient mysteries needs to be further amplified. The mysteries had a purpose, to create a Superman. Where have you heard that before? Hitler said it, and they're working in secret in laboratories right now toward the same goal. The mysteries had a purpose to create a Superman, one capable of understanding the true nature of the universe and to worship the true God. W.L. Wilmshurst, a Mason, wrote these thoughts in his book entitled The Meaning of Masonry. Quote, this, the evolution of man into Superman, was always the purpose of the ancient mysteries, and the real purpose of modern masonry is not the social and charitable purposes to which so much attention is paid, but the evolution of those who aspire to perfect their own nature and transform it into more godlike quality, unquote. And need I say as an aside here, what a... Freemason said to a friend of mine who was his son. He said, Son, if you are not one of us, you are nothing. And of course, the son was not one of them. And to his great credit, has never become one of them. W.L. Wilmshurst amplified this thought a little later in his book. Quote, man who has sprung from the earth, meaning that he was not created by a creator, God, and developed through the lower kingdoms of nature to his present rational state, has yet to complete his evolution by becoming a God-like being and unifying his consciousness with the omniscient to promote, which is and always has been the sole aim and purpose of initiation, unquote. And he goes on, quote, No higher level of attainment is possible than that in which the human merges in the divine consciousness and knows as God knows, unquote. <laughs> what have I been telling you all this time, folks? So just as Satan tempted mankind with the ability to know good and evil themselves, just like God, without his assistance, now the Masons are teaching that they too could become a god through an initiation into the ancient mysteries. John Anthony West, in his book Serpent in the Sky, wrote this in support of Mr. Wilmshurst's statement, quote, Egypt started with the concept of divine attributes within man. The gods are not brought down to earth, rather man is raised to the gods, unquote. Others, besides the above-mentioned Masons, like Louis Furbach, have joined the discussion with similar thoughts. He was a 19th century philosopher and a hero of the communists like Karl Marx. In fact, Frederick Engels, the co-worker with Karl Marx during the time Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto as a hired writer hack, wrote this about his friend. Quote, all the communists of 1845 were followers of Furbach. The reason 
that the communists supported the ideas of Feuerbach is apparent when the student reads his writings, for he wrote, quote, Man alone is our God, our Father, our Judge, our Redeemer, our true home, our law, and our rule, the Alpha and Omega of our life and of our political, moral, public, and domestic activity. There is no salvation save through the medium of man, unquote. John Denver, the well-known popular singer, has adopted this same philosophy about his divinity. He has been quoted as saying this after his new conversion. Quote, it's the single most important experience of my life. I can do anything. One of these days I'll be so complete I won't be human, I'll be a god, unquote. It's the same thing that's taught in the Mormon church. If a married couple produce many children and conform to the teachings of the church, then when they die, they will be gods and they will be given a planet of their own and they will continue their reproduction, only they will be souls and they will populate the planet and will be the gods of the planet. What crap! What absolute crap! Where do these people get their egos? I'll be a god. Yeah, sure you will. <laughs> If you guys are all gods, then how come you still got to pay your bills? How come you get sick? And how come you got to go to the doctor? And if you go to the doctor, what's that make the doctor if you're God? Huh? You're all a bunch of fools. You're blithering idiots. You've lost your mind. Your egos have run away with the rest of you. And you're going to die like everyone else. And you're going to find out like everyone else what really happens when people die. And as far as I know, no one on this earth really knows or is likely to know until it happens to them. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Mr. Hall, the Mason, stated a similar thought when he wrote this in his book entitled Lectures on Ancient Philosophy. Quote, we may study the star intellectually, but we have never attained consciousness until we are the star. Unquote. <coughs> but this idea that man could become a god is not new. The Bible anticipated it, and Isaiah wrote about it back in 741 B.C. This is what he wrote in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 10. Quote, Thus saith the Lord, Understand that I am he. Before me there was no god formed, neither shall there be after me, unquote. And once again in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 5, quote, I am the Lord, and there is none else, there is no God beside me, unquote. And remember, all the Roman emperors declared themselves God, and they all died like every other man died, some of them by the assassin's sword or knife. God, yeah, mm hmm boy, you guys just take the cake, I'll tell you. How you can meet and, and throw that baloney around to each other and swallow it and pump each other up to believe that you're gods or you're going to be gods is beyond my understanding. The Bible teaches that there is but one God and that mankind has no possibility of sharing his Godhead. One who apparently has not believed those statements in the Bible is Shirley MacLaine, who has become a spokesman for the position that man can become a god. She has written several books on the subject of her support of the New Age. Newsweek magazine described her as the New Age evangelist, and she wrote the following statement in her book entitled Dancing in the Light, quote, We are part of God, unquote, and this elsewhere in the same book, quote, If one says audibly, I am God, the sound vibrations literally align the energies of the body to a higher attunement, unquote. Yeah, I bet it does. Yep, yep, I bet the insanity molecules take over every portion of the body, and you really all feel great until you have to go pay your rent. Or you catch the flu. Or somebody just knocks the crap out of you to try to bring you back to reality which is exactly what should happen when, when you do those kinds of things. 
What's wrong with just living life peacefully with other people and enjoying what we have? What's the big thing that you have to become God? And I'll tell you right now, you never will. You might as well just, well, never mind. If you want to be God, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. You're deceiving yourself, and that's okay, as long as you don't hurt anyone else. If each man is a god, mankind is capable of making decisions for their own welfare. Each man has complete control of his decision-making. According to Miss McLean, in fact, man's control is extended into areas few have ever claimed for mankind, and these are the thoughts of Miss McLean. Quote, I think we choose to be together. We choose our parents, and I think the parents choose the children they want to have before they ever come in to an incarnation, unquote. Tell that to an abused child. Tell that to a child who's raised by drunken, miserable, stinking parents who don't give a damn about the child. Tell that to all those people who know that that's total false, irresponsible ramblings of an insane maniac. And you know what they say when they're confronted with this? They say you agreed to it in a previous life and that you're, you're paying off your karmic debt. You see, they have a rationalization for everything. And it's just more bullshit. More lies. More crap. She went on further to record another strange thought when she wrote this, quote, there was no such thing as reality, only perception, unquote. Well, surely, let me tap you on the jaw with my fist, and then you tell me that there's no reality. Of course, I don't really want to do that, folks, but that's just a way to bring her to her senses. If it were legal, I might try it. Might try it. Might wake her up might show her that her perception is only reality. <laughs> One can only wonder where Miss McLean got these bizarre thoughts from. Several clues that can assist the student in understanding her have been given by either her own revelations or from some articles that have appeared about her in the media. In her book entitled Out on a Limb, she wrote about her meetings with her married lover in her apartment. <laughs> this God is breaking up somebody else's marriage, and uh, she's meeting with her married lover in her apartment. She commented that he looked at her shelf of books on, amongst other subjects, Marxist theory, including a biography of Karl Marx. There's nothing wrong with that. I have those books in my library and many more, many more. But knowing, knowing Shirley MacLaine, and folks, I do, Knowing this scatterbrained twit, when she has books on Marxist theory, including a bar biography of Karl Marx, you can bet that she's a socialist. And of course she is. Parade Magazine of December 18, 1988, had an article on Miss McLean in which it revealed that her den had lots of framed pictures, surely with communist Fidel Castro and with communist Nikita Khrushchev, amongst others. The magazine reported how Shirley and her lover, quote, talked about democratic socialist principles and how it was possible to have them both at the same time if the rich would only share their wealth more. Elsewhere in her book, she wrote about how much of a hypocrite she was when she added this contradictory statement, and they all do, quote, wanted to talk to him about how I had made a lot of money and that it made me feel elite in a world that was broke to know I could buy just about anything I wished for, unquote. Just like Jane Fonda, who's been pushing for gun control for years was stopped by law enforcement officers on the freeway and her car was found to contain many pistols and weapons, firearms. Hypocrites and liars. However, nowhere in her book did she say that she had freely donated any of her own wealth to the relief of the poor. Apparently she believes that the communist ideas about wealth sharing are acceptable only as long as she does not have to share her wealth like she wants the other rich to do. You see, most rich 
purport to be socialist, but in actual practice none of them really are. None of them would give away their wealth to the poor, ever. Yet they pretend to be liberal, socialist, Marxist, in reality. They demonstrate that they are exactly the opposite. They are liars and hypocrites. For the whole communist socialist idea is for the little people, you and I, who are to be their slaves in the New World Order. Miss McLean has since gone on a nationwide tour promoting her newfound religious views to the public. Newsweek magazine reported in 1987 that she had made a great deal of money explaining her new thoughts to others. Quote, since McLean began her tour in January 1987, more than 10,000 people in 15 cities have paid $300 admission fee. Unquote. Well, you know me, folks. I have absolutely nothing against that. If she could have got a thousand dollars ahead admission free, it would be okay with me. Now, ten thousand times three hundred equals three million dollars. I still have no complaint with that. This is the United States of America. If somebody wants it, give it to them. If they want to pay it, if they're that stupid, that's fine with me. I believe that people should be giving somebody something, though. But I also believe that if they're stupid enough to pay it, then they should be taken. That's how you learn. And a lot of people would disagree with me, but I'm sorry, folks. I'm sorry. That's what I believe. Obviously, Shirley's tours have proven to be both popular and lucrative. The Newsweek article on her seminar mentioned a little of what she teaches in them, the following of her few of her comments. Quote, the earth is moving off its axis, she says, and only the collective consciousness of mankind can right it. For the spiritually inclined, a window of light will appear on those days, August 16th and 17th, 1987, that McLean says will allow us to rise to a higher plane of cosmic understanding, unquote, pure bullshit, pure crap, pure new age mesmerism, if you will, for nothing happened on those dates. Evangelist McLean became Dr. McLean when she reported some of her new cures for two of the world's most serious medical problems, AIDS and cancer of the abdomen. According to the Newsweek article, she told our, her audience, quote, they, or those who paid to hear her in the 15 cities on the tour, all got to hear McLean's pronouncements on such subjects as AIDS. She thinks sufferers are sick because they have been bereft of love necessary to sustain the balance of health. And cancer, for cancer of the abdomen, she advises putting patients in a yellow room because yellow is the color frequency of that part of the body. Unquote. More New Age mesmerism bullshit crap. And to thank her patients only have to pay $300 for such wisdom. But Dr. McLean is not as dumb as one might think. The Newsweek magazine article reported, quote, everyone who attended had to sign waivers absolving the seminar's organizers from responsibility for psychological injury, unquote. How clever, how clever of Miss McLean. So someone in charge of arranging her seminars is aware that her ideas might cause psychological damage to those attending, and they have moved to protect her from malpractice lawsuits. Now, not only was this New Age evangelist making money on her personal lecture tours, she was also making money on her best-selling books. Now, I don't know what's wrong with A. Ralph Epperson. I don't know why he's saying this, because he purports to believe in the Constitution and the principles and ideals upon which this country was based, and there is nothing wrong with making money on anyone's personal lecture tours are on their books, and I can tell you right now that A. Ralph Epperson makes money on his lecture tours and on his books, and that's how he makes his living. So as far as I'm concerned, that is a partial discreditation of A. Ralph Epperson. As of July 1987, her book entitled Out on a Limb had sold 3 million copies, and her other major seller, Dancing in the Light, had sold 2.2 million. Could he be jealous? Is it possible that A. Ralph Epperson is jealous of Shirley MacLaine's ability to sell books? Time Magazine reported that her five books on self-exploration and self-promotion have run to more than 8 million copies. Now, to me, that's admirable. 
If someone can write something that is so desirable by 8 million people that it sells 8 million copies, I don't care what they're writing about. That's admirable. She's providing an income for herself, her family, and people are obviously buying her books because they want them. Therefore, she's supplying them with a service. Whether it's bullshit or not, it doesn't matter. That's the American way, folks. That's what it's all about. There was a lot of people back in the early part of this century who hated automobiles and therefore Henry Ford was the devil but he sold an awful lot of them and he came under the criticism of a lot of people for doing it sorry folks that's the American way as far as I'm concerned what A. Ralph Epperson is spouting in these few sentences here is socialism and I admire him for his research and what he's done and I know that he makes his living selling books and lecturing and for him to spout this socialist attitude when he is doing the same thing is not acceptable and he is a friend of mine and I will certainly bring this to his attention you know I read this book a long time ago and I'd forgotten that he had said these things but I certainly will bring it to his attention in fact we may talk about it on the air when he's a guest of the show and he will be a guest of the show very shortly so you can look forward to some kind of an explanation of this he says it appears as if selling the new age religion can be very profitable well Barnum and Bailey was very profitable and it was all an illusion just like the new age religion but in summary perhaps the most cogent comment about the battle between the New Age and the Christians was made by Nesta Webster in her book entitled Secret Societies. Quote, the war now begins between the two contending principles, the Christian conception of man reaching up to God and the secret society conception of man as God, needing no revelation from on high and no guidance but the law of his own nature. And since that nature is in itself divine all that springs from it is praiseworthy and those acts usually regarded as sins are not to be condemned unquote. you've heard me say before that in the new world order the law will be do as thou wilt shall be the whole of the law and it will the battle lines are drawn between those who believe in a creator God and those who believe that man can become God these are the two opposing positions, and the battle between them, dear listeners, has most certainly begun. Now, don't get too upset over my criticism of the few paragraphs that A. Ralph Epperson wrote, condemning Shirley MacLaine's ability to write books and lecture and bring in a lot of money. For I'm sure that in his zeal which many of us get carried away with, in his zeal to condemn the worship of Lucifer and the secret societies, he carried it a little bit too far, but we'll bring it up when he's a guest on the show. For I'm a little bit curious about it myself, but I haven't jumped off the edge. Let's put it that way. Well, folks, you've all been asking what to do to save your assets. What? Where can you put your money? Where can you put your valuables, what can you do to survive this depression in the coming total economic collapse that anybody with any brains can see has to happen unless they can convince us all to accept a cashless society and that's the only thing that can save them. For without it, sooner or later, everyone's going to discover there is no cash and it will all come tumbling down. Well, we found a partner to delve into this finally after many many attempts to get a sponsor for the show and rejecting many 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 that we didn't believe in couldn't accept and that didn't fit our concept of what a sponsor should be or where you could invest your money safely but we found Swiss American Trading Corporation and you know me folks if I didn't believe in what they're doing, if I couldn't recommend them wholeheartedly to you, if I wouldn't use their services myself, then they certainly would not be a sponsor on this show. They've been in business for over 11 years. They can deliver to your door non-confiscatable, non-reportable hard assets. 
They write a newsletter that deals openly with the imminent economic collapse, doesn't pull any punches, tells it exactly like it is. They consider privacy and discretion an integral part of their relationship with all of their clients. This is Swiss America Trading Corporation. I recommend them wholeheartedly. But remember, you'll be talking to people who have their own ideas about what an investment should be, and you are the ones who should guide the conversation. You should ask for advice, you should do your own research, and you should dictate what you should buy from anybody. Remember that. Now call 1-800-289-2646 right now. 1-800-289-2646. Tell them you listened to the Hour of the Time with William Cooper. Tell them that William Cooper sent you, ask for their newsletter entitled Protecting Your Future. They'll send it to you. You have no obligation, folks. It won't cost you a nickel except for the phone call. Do it. You're going to be surprised. I guarantee it. You're going to enjoy this newsletter, and all you have to do is commit an hour in reading and considering the information that you get. So call 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. 1-800-289-2646. And tell them that William Cooper sent you. Good night, and God bless you all. Mm -hmm.